since in the hour after the year when I ask you the question, um, could you think of a time after Chizkiyo when people were um, uh, in Yerushalayim were um, worshipping idols after the time of Chizkiyo, which is like, Malach, it, it's written here, I'm looking at it, Malachim days. I mean, the most obvious is his son Menashe. Okay, but like, in that time frame, I mean, that's still 2,500 years ago, like, any time after that. Like a substantial um, amount. Well, we find evidence of that sporadically, sometimes worse, sometimes better, but the Yetzirah of idolatry will be nullified in the early t- early years of the second base of Mikdash. So that does not obliterate idolatry forever, but there isn't the same compelling urge. Which would be around the time of uh, like what time frame? That's like close to. Any, so well, it depends on which calendar you're using. Hi, Jake. Hi, Yaakov. Um, it depends on which time frame you're using, but um, you know, according to traditional dating, we would say that by Shani is something like 2,400 years ago. Okay. 2,400 years ago. Yeah. This okay. Okay, I'll talk to you in an hour when this becomes relevant. Okay. Mysterious question. I'll, I'll just leave you on for an hour. Yeah, great. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right, fine. Good. I like a little drama. Uh, good. Anybody else? Anybody else have anything going on? Oh, uh, you know, the national one day of Cuba of Aim. No, it's Cuba Aim. Then we have a different day for Cuba Aim. Right. Is it an Issa de Raisa to observe it as Bechuko Seim Lo Silechu? Probably not. Oh, uh, we, we like doing this. I mean, I don't know if yeah. you if you Dafka do the the way they ritualize it and get her specifically get her a Hallmark greeting card, which is what the commercials ah, tell you to thing. do, or, or 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 send a bouquet of flowers, right? I mean, if you did it, you know, if you, I don't know, if you send her a, a you know a, a big a big tub of borscht, maybe you know something distinctly Jewish. I actually have a Shiloh based on something that I did get. So I got okay. I got um, like this sandwich maker panini press waffle iron all in one, and the way it works is it's got but like not a, really a sandwich press mini um, iron so, all at once. So the way it works is you swap out the plates. Um, so like the you heating the attachments apple, there. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it like the floor wax dessert reference or? But, oh right, no no you were just you, just, you had a like in there so I. <laughs> So uh, go ahead. I'll let you ask your question. It's been four yeah, years since so I heard someone out. make that joke, Randy. <laughs> but yeah, so the plates are interchangeable. Oh my so, first! I'm sorry, Ethan. I'm not gonna let you finish. My 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 more recent one. I, I I like I've gotten used to, but I just can't handle literally. You literally can't take it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Still, from one to even, I can't. <laughs> So, so the shadows I figured if we can't take it. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Aton. I, I dare sh- you to finish your question. <laughs> the shadows is more is of a hetter because the plates can be swapped out. So, is there an issue of using the machine for milk and meat but keeping the plates reserved, like the waffle plates for um, milk egg and the and the burger plates for flation? There's probably a side to do it. I would ask a certified posek because. The minhag still is to have things that are separate. It's a minhag. You're not not talking in hardback because there's definitely, like you're saying, you're not actually. There's nothing. There's no nasinas tam. Right? There's no conveyance of taste because you're you're just using the outside, but the um, food is only going to contact whatever the relevant uh, milchiks or fleishiks as it is. But we try to distinguish because it's so easily. Yeah, you know, we have different salt and pepper shakers and different tablecloths. Technically, you wouldn't need any of these things. Is that people get to think everything confused so easily? So there isn't, isn't that I, I can't really picture honestly what you're describing, but couldn't it set a scene where somebody might mistakenly use it for one, meaning the other? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the reason. But so so in other words, it's quite, we're not in the history of Hector territory, I don't think. But I think it's still a Shiloh. Right. That's what I'd say. Good. Any other random questions? This is my chance to schmooze with you guys. That's what I, you know, which I kind of miss. But 
You, do, so, you don't have to. You don't have to ask for Orca. So oh, if yeah. Tarzan was in Florida and going on a dragon, would he still have to follow the Tzchumim? The rest of you, Yaakov's covering his face in frustration. The rest of you probably wouldn't understand the context. It's been four years since I heard a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of some of us fall fall into uh, familiar tropes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a uh, good. Probably. Shall we? Um, now I think I'll probably put this out. How do I get this the word out? Because we have. Um, you, you're, you're among, most of you are among the, the real regulars, um, and uh, there are a few others as well. And then we have a few people who join us sporadically on um, the day or the evening of Lagba Omer, Tuesday night. I think I'm going to somehow go to the Brickman and or Greenwald wedding, weddings, weddings. So I think I'll have to miss this. How do I announce that? Uh, we'll post in the, in the WhatsApp group. I think that's our best method of And that should reach anybody who might come and be disenchanted if they can't find us? Yeah, and alternatively, if they're watching the share on YouTube, then they'll have gotten that announcement that way. Great. Okay. Uh, I don't know where our crowd is, the people that are unusually late, but uh, or they're just not coming. So we will, we'll, we will launch. Unless, again, if anybody has anything, I'm happy to uh, do another question. But uh, uh, I have a question. if not, then we'll go back. Yeah, great. Hi, yeah. If hypothetically you were able to place a mezuzah inside of a wall, how deep into the wall could you place it to then have it still kosher as a mezuzah? Meaning, in, like, you have your wall, and how, obviously most people put the mezuzah on the wall. Could you put it here with, like, a doorway to access it? Could you put it inside the wall? I mean, the people do that. The, I don't know if there's a psul at all. I don't know how deep is deep. I, it has to be recognizable. Well, the purpose is that mezuzah is like tzitzit, like, like tefillin, which is to remind us of the mitzvahs. If it's so deeply in there, you don't see it, that's not good. But I, it frequently, oh, not frequently, but it comes up sometimes that people need to insert it um, when, for example, let's say, and we have this in the entry to our building, there's a door to the outside, not, not fancy or anything, but there's no, uh, the door opens into a, just a flat wall. There's no, um, there's no post to put a mezuzah. So, and you, yet you need one on the right of the entrance. So that's, so when you open the door, inserted in the, in the door frame is a, is a, is a little slot that they put the mezuzah in. And then you close the door and it's covered, it's kind of, which is actually ideally protected from the elements, but, uh, but that's kosher and it's visible. So, so the main point is that it has to be like visible? I think so. I think so. I'm answering off the cuff without having gone into it, and it's not an right. expertise at this stage, but I think that's okay. true. Bye. Yeah. Gavi, how you doing? I'm great, Ralph. How are you? Yeah, good. Good to see your name. <laughs> uh, anybody's able to put on the video, it's so, it's so much nicer. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I think we're done with the random questions, and we will end it. I'll stay, I'll stay later if there are more to come, uh, but we'll go back to Eov. Um, I'm assuming, maybe incorrectly, so you'll, you'll please uh, let me know, but I'm assuming that the previous material is familiar and fresh in your mind. One way I could do this is to, is to catch us up or to walk us through, give a summary of everywhere we, we were, or I'll go right into the continuation. What would be easier for you? Fine. If you're lost yeah, and you don't understand what I'm saying or you forgot something we talked about, there's an easy solution. You just ask. And I hope you're feeling I, I hope you're feeling comfortable enough. I, I I think this format. I just finished my share malachim a few minutes ago. I think this format strangely intimidates people. People are more reticent than I'm used to. But fine. Okay. Um, so I mean, I will say very briefly. We're now going into, and I'm going to be summarizing and really playing up some of the major themes. But I'm not going as thoroughly through all the text in the middle sections of EO. Uh, it's long, and if you read it also, especially if it's the first reading. It's, it's um, cumbersome, it's, there's a lot there. And so I'm gonna tease out some of the, some of the ideas uh, and it's certainly ripe and rich for uh, rereading and going back into it, especially my purpose here is to give an overview of some of the major ideas in EO. That's what we called, the, we called this class, all the big ideas in one book. Uh, and there's certainly so much more that we're not gonna tease out, so uh, you'll do that. Eov now is responding to the cumulative tragedy that is his life right now. And 
uh, he's as uh, as opposed to the first chapter where he uh, responded in glowing terms. He's a role model in many ways, uttering uh, famous psukim about accepting Hashem's will, good, bad, or whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Um, now he's not responding as strongly. He's been devastated now personally, and he feels he, feel, he recognizes that some supernatural forces at work here, and not quite sure why me. The perennial question: Why me? And he curses the day he was born. And as the as as Ben Ben, ben Richmond picked up on this, the Ramban the Ramban says this, the Malbim says like this. He seems to be moving into a um, a mode of, of, of belief of uh, theology where he believes in Hashem, certainly he just doesn't get it. And he, he's subscribing to a, to a sense of um, like almost what we call a deist way of looking at life, where Hashkocha is not really tangible. We don't really see how Hashem is working in the world. And uh, it's, 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 it's an outlook that's oh, oh so fam familiar to us if we're alive today. There are a lot of people who subscribe to this. Um, there are variations of this too. It's not like there's a, there's a finite deist way of looking at things, but that Hashem, the clockmaker, but he wound up the world, let it go, and we're kind of here on our own, and that there's a sense of uh, ambigu ambiguity and vague and, and uh, randomness in the way uh, in the way our lives flow. Which, just to set the record straight, we believe anything is every it couldn't be further from the truth. Hi Shmuel. Uh, couldn't be further from the truth that Hashem is deeply involved intimately with each of us and with all of us collectively in the workings of the world. We just don't get it. Um, but so of course, I, yeah. I had a question on that because on the, on the view that you have as a non-Jew and non-Jews are affected by the Muzalos, um, what's the where's the fine line? Non-Jews, I, I don't know what you said, but I'm pretty sure you said non-Jews, yesh mazel, you know, yesh mazel. They, they're, they're in within the Muzalos, that doesn't mean that necessarily that, that, that there's no Ashkoch pratis for them. It's not as immediate. They're not as involved with Hashem by, by choice, and so they're not, they're not uh, in the same level of Ashkoch as the Jews. Keep going. I'm sorry I cut you off. No, I think Rebbe answered the question. I was going to ask, ask what's the, the fine line between, uh, you know, this whole the clockwork system and then, um, like, the like. Okay, yeah, I think, I, I think in general, I think we addressed this last week too, but these are such important themes, it's good to repeat them sometimes, that it's not just with the non-Jews, I think in general, in the world, welcome Aviel, I think in general yeah. in the world, uh, we see this, that um, Hashem is more responsive to the big tzaddikim. It's sort of a global quid pro quo, if you will, right? You do for me, I do for you. Right, so if we're deeply, intimately extending ourselves and trying and trying to lead lives of merit and goodness, and we daven and we reach out in our davening, so Hashem responds in kind. That if we lead lives of passivity and we're not really involved and we're kind of lumps on the, you know, lumps on the log, or we're just, or or worse, so then indeed he, he also shows in kind. He's not so involved with us either. Where is Hashem found? Anywhere where he's let in. And that those are those are uh, it, it is about a brief way of characterizing a complex theology as we have. That's the way we understand it. That it's a sliding scale. So, with this in mind, um, consider and open your safer to the third parak now. Now, I'm not going to be reading everything in depth, but we see that Eov has his friends. They were sitting quietly, and Eov opens his mouth. He curses his day. You know what? I am going to just read very briefly to the tenth pasuk, and we'll just get a sense of where Eob's going. We said, we said, oh, that the uh, Eob declaimed, saying, oh, that the day upon which I was to be born might never have been, nor the night fallen in which it was said, a man is sired, a man, in other words, a man has been given birth to. May that day be darkness. Let Hashem pay no heed from above, so that dawn may not break upon it. In other words, uh, I can't control any of this, but it would have been better perhaps not to have been born. May it be sullied by murkiness and dread shadows, enveloped in lowering clouds, petrified by the demons who stalk by day. May gloom snatch that night, joyless midst the days of the year, uncounted among the months. Mark well that night shall be forlorn, no sounds of cheer shall be shall uh, 
obtrude upon it. One gets the impression in, in uh, Eob's days that they didn't have Xanax, right? These are not uplifting spirits, but this is how a depressed person speaks, no? Sound familiar to any of us? Pasuk 7, let those who curse their fate, those who stand ready to keen at their dirges, imprecate it. Ooh, art scroll, you're so precise, but not always so accessible. Uh, want me to translate the art scroll into English, anybody? Yeah, I think you'd read seven. Well, the first part's okay. Let those who curse their fate, those who stand ready to uh, respond to the mournful melodies. Uh, right, let them beg for it. Eight, oh, that its twilight stars be dimmed. Let it crave light, but there is none. May not see the blush of dawn. For that, he did not shut the portals of my womb, thereby hiding weariness from my sight. Well, there it's about, in, in nine, it's about as explicit as it's been. Right? Couldn't I just stay inside where it's nice and warm? Anybody recall this? I did this, uh, a bunch of you were there. Do you remember the alumni Shabbaton in Passaic? And yeah, you might remember this from this year because I bring this out. I got it. I think Rev Steyer was the one who originally showed me this. Hi, Shamai. Hi, Ben. I just I saw you guys just joined us. Um, ooh, what a note. If you came in in the middle of that, you must have been. I, I hope nobody's like feeling really depressed right now. That would be really uh, not, not a good time to uh, come in on. Um, well, remember this, remember this fantastic Medrash, Parshish Pikude, that walks through the various phases of the Neshama. When it's in the when it's in Egan Eden, and then it's brought out by the special angel that's assigned to it, and then it has to be thrust down into a womb of a woman, and then it's brought into this world and the various phases of the world, and then into death. Let me remember this. It's the convo you had with Gilad, right? Say it again. Right. Oh, right, right, right. It's the car ride with Gilad, where I yeah. thought Gilad would crash. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. And he, he was, he was, no, no. It, it was a very, very, you know, emistic yeah. kind of kind of reactions to it. It's, it's, it's a stunner. If you've never seen it or heard it, it's worth going through rigorously inside. I, I can send it to you if you want to get the original. A, a, who remembers this? Anybody? Does it resonate with any of you? Yeah, I do. Great. Okay, one answer out there. Good. Two, maybe. Uh, okay, so um, anyway, one of the things that's really striking of the many, many things to pick up in the Medrash is, the, is how at every phase in, I mean, in the pre pre life stage and then the pre life stage and then in the womb, at every phase the neshama is really content to just be where it is, and it argues and struggles and says, "No, no, don't bring me out of here. I like the status quo," and the malach has to sort of cajole it and kind of say, "Well, come on, it'll be fine. You'll come to the next phase." And and one of the arguments, more in a very uh, striking image, is the sense you know the baby does not want to leave the warmth of the mother's womb comes into the world, gets a big patch, so it has to start breathing. What a pain in the neck that is, Corona days. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and, and is crying because it was so much more comfortable inside, you know, and no um, indigestion, right? Uh, right, it's a little Ghanadin in there. And uh, then we're in this world and it's all kind of bitter and miserable as the, and they, they walk, the, walk the way through, but then it's time for death to come. And again, no, don't take me, I'm too comfortable here. I mean, on the basic psychological level, we resist change, but there is this sense of uh, it's scary out there in the big wide world. And, uh, and, and Eov has reason to be scared. And you sense this, you sense this dread setting in as he's, again, you, you have the scene in your mind now. It's quite, it, it's a very vivid scene, right? He's rolling in the dust. That's his only comfort, boils head to toe. Uh, and when we say head to toe, that's to be taken. Uh, here is a use of the word that is correct, literally. I just had um, I, I had um, cried out against the misuse of the word, but literally, he is covered, and he's lost everything. And his wife's telling the curse him, and she's all she's she's uh, of no comfort. And he has these friends that are non friends at this stage, and he's in a void. What, how could it get worse? Of course, Eov had an encounter Jewish history. Let, let us tell him how we could get worse, what we endured in our history. 
And then we get to this pasuk. He says, in Hebrew it says, in, in Yud, anybody wants to follow, I encourage you to. Lama lo mirechem amus mi beten yatsasi ve'egva. Why would I not die straight from the womb? Come forth from the belly and expire. Mm. Here, he's not suicidal. None of his words have been suicidal. He's just totally passive. Take me, Hashem. Uh, there's another scene in, in, in the Tanakh. I don't really want to go there right now, but anybody who wants to pursue it, consider Eliyahu Navi. His response after he flees from Izevil before he gets to Chorev, mm -hmm. seemingly a similar response. Mm -hmm. Consider Yonah Hanavi at the very end of the four chapters of Yonah. And he seems to be brought to a very similar kind of passive, passive wish that couldn't you just snap your fingers and I disappear? He seems to be pleading with Hashem. How poignant. So um, Aristotelians, people who take this view of the world that Hashem isn't there, try to put yourself, maybe you are in this mindset. I wouldn't wish it upon you. But some people subscribe to this uh, outlook in life that there's a creator of the world, but he's not involved. And then put yourself in Eov's footsteps right in, in, in his shoes uh it's interesting because it's desperate and miserable and lonely and cold inside here in this world but there's a sense also they almost it's like they're almost lacking in self-confidence they don't want to go outright and deny the ashkach explicitly you know it's possible that they're wrong about all this after all and chas i'm going to get called out for this uh, it comes to mind the expression, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Right? Uh, cur he's cursing his fate, he's not sure. But, you know, to take an active step and do something, Eob's not there. So clearly there is some kind of this conflicted amuna here, which is something that should resonate us, resonate for us, if not, as Rosh Hashem, not in our own examples, but we see it all around us in the world. Eov goes on like this, and now I'm not going to read all of the inter, inter, intervening psukim. You can, and I'm happy to follow requests if you want me to, but I'm skipping. Um, there's a lot of profound uh, things to say, some of them more problematic than others. Then skip to 19. He asks a question. He asks a lot of questions, and he's not waiting for any answers. He seems to be asking them rhetorically. He asks, Lama yiten la'amel o v'chaim lamari nafesh? It's a new variation. Why should light be granted to the weary, life to the embittered? What's in the question? What is this? It feels almost sadomasochistic. Why, why, why put us through this? We're, this we're, we're put to the ringer, we human beings. Does it mean maybe? I mean, there's a very familiar complaint that people have of their lives, of their lot in life. I mean, to live is to suffer. There is nobody who does not suffer in this world. I cut somebody off. Yeah, I was going to say, does it mean maybe, like, why, like, tease him with, like, a life that he would have enjoyed and then take it away? I think you might be reading into it. I think that's a great insight. I don't see that in these words. He's asking more simply. Why should you just give anything to the weary, life to the embittered? Again, this is continuing his earlier point that why put us here if it's just for dread and misery? I think, you know, in a sense, Aviel, what you ask makes this even more poignant for the modern man because in modern days, we have something that I don't think even Eov was, was, was subject to. We have this, we live surrounded by this lie of perfection. You know what I'm talking about? What do you mean? The sense that out there, uh, something, a theme that I return to frequently, out there somehow is the good life. And if you only had the Horatio Alger, and you just worked for it, you know, like those families on TV, they're all so happy and pretty. Right? Yeah. And they got it good. How come I don't? 
meaning you're, you're teased almost with the sense that the good stuff is right out there for the, for the, for the taking, and yet it eludes us. That's much worse than this. That's much worse than what Eob's just saying, ah, oh, it's so painful, just take me. Ready? Yeah. I, I'm reminded of when I was asking uh, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto of how um, it seems like we're so weak now and everyone back then was holding on to such a higher level. And I remember Ruby told me that um, people back then were struggling too. And I'm, I'm wondering, maybe it was on a totally different level for sure, but is it possible that also back then or in any point in history people were also always looking to the grass is always greener like maybe oh if i'm the uh, barbarians in germania uh, if only i could get to rome rome over there looks so nice and they're they're having a perfect life even though they they were all slight like meaning was there always is there has there always felt sure that's a human i'm sure that's a classic human impulse it's always it's envy and so on i'm just pointing out that today it's much more pronounced we're living in, in, in where affluence and luxuries are all over the place, on display, in the display case, and everybody's got it but me. I don't think we, I don't think we ever had this, and, and, and arguably then we've become the weakest of generations. We're all, I mean, <laughs> this third chapter is a wowzer, and it's, uh, don't give it to your depressed friend, because he's going he's gonna to read too much into it. And, 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 and draw wrong conclusions. I mean, Question. Eov, we understand quite clearly here. Moshe wrote it, Eov wrote it. Whoever, whoever's bringing us these words prophetically is, is, is describing a very common, relatable human uh, state of mind, and it's wrong and flawed, meaning sometimes you have to learn the way not to be. Question, Rabbi? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, so bear with me, but... I find it interesting that Eov kind of asks why people in general uh, are born, given that they're suffering, obviously as a result of his extraordinary suffering. I'm not, I, it's just surprising that he asks how come people in general have to suffer when obviously his suffer is more and beyond anything that anyone experiences. Right. I don't know, but my first thought is this. I, I, I'm just saying this uh, spontaneously without having considered, um, and maybe there's another answer that it's possible that Eov was in his own mind through his life, one of the lucky ones. He was with the jet setters. He had it all. And he must have been surrounded by other people who were not, not quite as fortunate. So when he's, when all this, everything is dramatically and suddenly taken away from him, certainly it's, it's, it's more of a trauma. If you're used to, we, we mentioned this before, a person who's used to great wealth and then loses it, that's harder. On the other hand, maybe he's now, by being brought down, he's saying, well, look, I at least tasted the good life. Now I'm finally seeing what those other plebeians out there are experiencing. Mm. And now maybe he's realizing, wait a minute, maybe this is just the human lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember walking out of some of those, I mentioned, uh, my, it, also it's a relatable time and most of us have experienced it, um, those banquets at the end of the year feeling, oh, Wow. I mean, you know, what people have, their pecola that they walk through in life, and some of those people, and you just spent the year together, who knew that these people had that kind of suffering, who went through those hardships, and then you look around at the world, and you realize, wow, people have gone through quite a lot. Okay, some comment. The Ramban here, Ramban, Nachmanides, sees this as a watershed, this pasuk. What is it meaning a major transition? The Ramban, if you've been tracking it, sees Eov in, in initially, initially is flawed. He has Yerushimayim, but not Abishimayim. By the end of the first chapter, he's, he's ascended. He's reached a great level. He's finally discovered reasons to love Hashem. Uh, Eov speaks of his own toils now. But the, the, the big transition now is something, Ramban is picking up on something I think that you were getting at, Yaakov, too. He's now has a new level of compassion. He's, he includes not just himself, he sees all the bitter souls, uh, which in itself, he thinks is a lack of ashkocha. He thinks it can't be. I mean, it's not just that I'm innocent, man. Why me? But really now he's, he's like a collective complaint. Why us? Now, at this stage, the Ramban says, 
his emun is not so not that terribly diminished. He he reveres Hashem. What he's really saying is, Hashem, show yourself something. As yes, Woody Allen said, like, I don't know, if only Hashem would give me a, a sign, like making a large deposit in my name in a Swiss bank account. Right, but something. <laughs> uh, Ramban says that Eov has become more stuck and more solidified in his view than ever. Uh, evil in the world, he feels now, and the Ramban... Uh, Ben, Ben, last last week you, you you posted this idea too that evil in the world must be in the stars, must be in the constellations. It's just the way we're born. It's just inevitable. It's the way we're supposed to be. For it's not the nature of the benign director to create beings in order to harm them. I'm quoting the Ramban, and that's his describing Eo's attitude. How could it? Yeah, what is it? Some kind of global amusement park? You know what I find interesting about this also? It's like, it's almost like the Sultan was trying to test him and like trying to make it seem like, oh, let's see how he reacts. But let's say he passes the test of flying colors. He doesn't get his family back. You know, he doesn't, it's, even let's say he passes the test. You know, it's not like it's just a test that it's just, oh, now everything's going to go back to normal. I mean, he still lost his family. He's still. Very intuitive. Live. Very intuitive. Yeah. Stay tuned. A mm -hmm. uh, few more days. We'll see what happens in the end. We're yeah. in the middle still. And I like your observation now, though, because it makes me think. Uh, the Satan's maybe out of the picture in any in any uh, real way. We don't see him outwardly, but that's the way we experience the Yitzhahara, too. We also don't perceive the Yitzhahara when he's middle, in the middle of his mischief. The Satan's still very active, behind, in front, by the sides of the scenes. And he's still, remember, his purpose is to test and push and prod, teasing out the real person. You know, finally, we're hearing Eov's voice. And Shama, you were also on to this last week, too. You know, is the, who's the real Eo? Well, we're starting to get a glimpse of the real guy beneath the surface. Yeah. And it's not all pretty. Rebbe, did you just say a, a couple more days or weeks? I, I don't know if we could, I could do so many more. Uh, well, it gets upbeat. Don't worry. This is, this is, this is one of the more depressing uh, chapters. It gets, it gets a little bit better. Wait till they start getting savage on one another. Then it, then it, then it becomes a blood sport. Uh, uh, Rebbe, one, one, one quick question. Um, yeah, Leo. Uh, like, what, what's the difference between Eov and all his like asking about asking about like I guess, why the good suffer, why the, why, why the good people suffer, and bad people are? I know he doesn't ask about bad people, yeah. But what's the difference between this and uh, and Moshe Rabbeinu when he asked Hashem? Oh, what a great question! What a great question. Well, Moshe, first, first look at context, Moshe. Uh, asks in the section, very famous section, um, when he's pleading on behalf of the sins immediately after the Cheta Egel, the sin of the golden calf. And uh, he's granted a certain intimacy with the Ribbono Shalom that makes him feel like he'd like to understand. He says, Hirene, show me your ways. And the question is perceived, because I'll say that what he's really asking is he'd like to understand how the world works, and it's in a, Moshe Rabbeinu, really, what he's doing is trying to take it, he's, he's using it as an opportunity, it's an ace ratzon, which means, you know, these kinds of things don't always, I don't, you don't always get that private audience with the Kaddish Baruch, it's like special Zoom one-on-one, -on -one, right? And getting to the core of this, if you understand what the perennial human condition and what we're doing here and how the suffering doesn't seem to add up and how do we make sense of it, well, Moshe Rabbeinu is going to hop around. He's going to try to take advantage of the opportunity. But for Moshe, it's an intellectual discovery. He just wants to understand, if you can uncover this, you'll, under, kind of, you'll, you'll, you'll figure out Hashem's ways, and then you'll get closer to Hashem. To know Hashem is to love Hashem. Mm -hmm. Eov doesn't seem, he's not anywhere processing on that level. He's brought down to the depths, and it's just... It's a primal scream as we hear it from Eov. I mean, I don't know. Is it possible to say that Moshe didn't suffer as much as Eov? Is that like, I mean, I don't know if you can really compare, but it, I don't know. Maybe if Eov had had it that way, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if you'd say that. But. Moshe certainly had hardship. I mean, Definitely. we start lining up who had more. You play that right. one-upsmanship game. People like to play that, by the way. Right. Uh, <laughs> you, you think you, you know, Jewish mother's kind of a joke. Yeah, you think you have it. Let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, 
I think really, and I think hopefully this is going to emerge from our ongoing discussions, but let me say one of the punchlines, sufferings in the eye of the, eye of the beholder, you have a well-grounded ashkafa. It's very much involving everything we're talking about and a lot more too. You don't suffer as much. You don't suffer as badly. You're able to take the exact same kind of fortunes or fate that comes, comes your way and emerge from it successfully. So I want to start, regardless what Moshe was, Moshe had his own pekala, his own problems, his attitude, his theology, if you will, if you, his, his whole way of coping, his coping mechanism was so much stronger, so much healthier. So if you can weather it, I came upon a vort this year. It's a familiar Rashi, but I never formulated it this way. I like it a lot. By the Makos, by, by Barad, particularly by the um, Hale, it's a lot of technical discussion about the difference between the different grains. Anybody remember this, Rashi's comment? The wheat was among the grains that was uh, destroyed by the hail in the, in the Ten Makos. And the, um, that's right, the spelt and the barley were okay. Because the spelt bent. What's that? Because the spelt bent. Right, that's exactly it. Good, Ari. Right, exactly. So what, and the difference is, and, and it's kind of counterintuitive because the wheat was upright and solid and sturdy. So you think, well, somebody who's upright and solid and sturdy, they should survive anything. But no, in fact, that's what the um, hail crushed. And the softer, fresher grains uh, were spared and were fine. So the vort that I thought, I don't think this is so brilliant or so far removed from what Rashi's telling us, the vort is simply that... Um, if you, can, if you face, confront life's challenges, sturdy and, sturdy and strong, but sort of also the negative side of that is rigid, unbending. So it, they have a tendency to um, crush you. If you don't flow with what life sends you, if you fight it, you see a lot of people fighting their, their, their destiny and not accepting what Hashem sends, that's what ultimately destroys them, the fighting itself. Whereas if you, and there's a great Hebrew word for it, in modern Hebrew, they also use it. If you're zovem, if you flow with it, you accept it. It's part of Kabbalah's Yisurim, a major idea. Accepting suffering, not being, not being, uh, not avoiding it, but neither also, neither fighting it. Okay, there's Hashem sending me. I, my job is to walk through this minefield of life and simply navigate it as effectively as I can. I mean, chas v'shalom, a person could be blown up by a mine at any moment. But in the meantime, all I all all that Hashem could reasonably expect from me is that I is that I walk gracefully. Wait, um, there's always one more thing. Like, what I find really interesting, like, usually when something bad happens to us, we try to like say, "Oh, it's like for the good." It's like there's obviously a, a bigger reason for this. It's for the good. And we learned this, that from Nachum Ishgams, who Gams Latova, who got it from his Rebbe Rebbe Kiva, called the Avi Rebbe Manal and everything that God sends ultimately is for the good. Yeah. In this case, he's like dying for like the reason, like, you know, why did this happen to me? And why do we all suffer? And I feel like the reason here isn't such a consoling reason. He just being, he's being tested. We haven't given any reason yet. Well, well, I mean, isn't it because the Satan wanted to test him to see if he would, how he would react to it? That was essentially yes, the reason. Yes, but, but you're asking for something, I think, more, more reasonable and more legitimate, but why? Okay, it's to tease out what we're really made of, but why would Hashem set up the structure at all like this? I mean, Hashem can make any world in, that he wants. He doesn't have to include suffering. Right. What, what, is, what is the purpose of this? Right. So, um, so, Rob. Yeah. Can't you, can't you argue, argue that, that EO pointing suffering, um, not, not individually, but to the whole world, can't you argue that's a lower sense of emuna than just pointing it at himself? Don't know if I got your meaning. I, I is, can you explain it a little better? Yeah, as in like he's he's saying like 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 to me, I feel like someone could interpret it as um as okay, I'm suffering individually, okay. But to say but to point to the whole world and say, God, you make everyone suffer, not just myself, can't you can't you argue that that's that's a lower sense of, of emuna? I think he makes that case. That's a fair. That's a fair argument, and I think it could be read into these psukim very well. Yeah, but it's also look as far as logic works. You could see why a person might come to that. 
Meaning, I don't, I mean, we're certainly uh, encouraged to make our own judgment calls. You know, this is not a great thing and you're right to try to rank this, you know, this good, better, and best in these, in these, in these issues. But I think there's also, one of the things by learning about this is there's a sense of empathy that we're supposed to recognize each of these kind of phases. We kind of see this in our experience in the world. And there are people who are, who are brought to this. And okay, that's a human reaction. Maybe not a great one. The Ramban to finish his point, he says, this is Eob's big shift. He reveres Hashem. He wishes that Hashem was more involved. He's come to the, at least for the time being, the conclusion that Hashem is not, uh, that everything is in the mazel. It's all in, it's all in fate, as they call it. Uh, and that Hashem, you know, is, uh, it is not in the nature of, it doesn't make sense, you know, why would, it has to be this way, because how could Hashem create us to play with us, to dawdle with us? We have an old friend who is old, who's 90. Uh, I make a point to try to visit when I'm in LA. She's a widow and uh, lives alone and uh, very totally functional, totally sharp. Uh, very, very uh, devoted to, to me, to our family. Uh, not a religious person, a Jewish person. Um, who I remember uh, having a discussion with her where she was uh, espousing this kind of theology. She said, you know why I reached 90 and my husband didn't, my sister didn't, and uh, I've had a pretty good run of it, she said, in one word, she said, it's all luck. I'm lucky. I made it this far. I, I, I just felt my heart drop when she said that. I was sitting, I was sitting there, I was, we were visiting with my kids and introducing her and the family, but I remember I thinking like, that's how you go through life. That's how you see this. It's not so, not so different than Eob's, Eob's present state. And it's a, uh, quite a miserable recipe for life and coping with, with what Hashem sends. In Pasuk 24, Skipping also. I'll start with 22, and then I have a comment on 24. 22, he says, The man who has lost his bearings, against whom God has raised a wall, for my sighing ushers in my meal, my groans gush forth like water. For I greatly frightened, I, excuse me, I was greatly frightened, and it had overtaken me, that which I dreaded, has come to me. To point out to anybody who's learned much Tanakh, these verses really are sui generis, which is a Latin term that just means they're one of a kind. They don't really bear comparison with almost anything else. They're not really driven by the narrative. Uh, they are not cinematic in the least, right? This, go, go try making E of the movie uh, and lose your own uh, bank account on it. Um, and it's 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 somebody who's like groping his way in the dark in a void and he's frightened now and it's overtaken me and the things that I dreaded most have happened. Pachad pachadati. Right, what well, it sounds it in Hebrew too. The Hebrew is so rich. Get the original. Pachad pachadati. Rashi comments here. Rashi says he had always been afraid that sin would catch up with him one day. Do you remember we talked about this in Shammai? We just made reference to this. Remember this in the first chapter? Always offering korbanos. Maybe something's not quite right. There's a sense of paranoia that haunts Eov in the early times we see him. Maybe we're seeing the limit, limitations of a person who's characterized as Yira Shemaim, as having fear of God, but not a lot, not the requisite amount of Avas Shemaim, the love of God that a person should really have to weather life in a favorable way. Right? So it's left him terrified in a void. Let's take a minute, put the text down for a little bit, and consider here the role of Nisayon, something we've been talking about but haven't really focused on. Um, and what is it, as far as we know outside, and we're going to learn more and say for Eov about this, but at least on a preliminary basis, what do we understand? Why, why does Hashem send a person a nisayon? First of all, what's the word? Uh, where, where does the word come from? What's the root of nisayon? <clears throat> Is it nes? Yeah, excellent. What is nes? Miracle. 
miracles. It's also Yarimu Nes. It's a flag. It can mean flag. There are a couple words for flag. Degel is also flag, but it can be a flag as in, um, well, it's used in, it's used in com computer terminology much the way uh, it's actually, it's in Bamidbar and, and, and next week's Parsha. Uh, a flag designates something. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to flag it. Flag them down. It's a signifier. A Nisayon stands as a signifier for who we are. And we've sort of been talking around this. There's a sense of a Nisayon eliciting the truth. Where do we find, where, what is it when we think Nisionos and we think of our heritage, what's the first obvious, obvious uh, image that comes to mind? Avram. 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 Sure. Avram. Think Nisayon, you think Avram Avinu. And then you think, wow, you know, we've been comparing Eo with Nisayon through the entire Sefer. With the entire, excuse me, Eo with Avram, this entire Sefer and this entire book. And now the comparison is really telling. As much as uh, Eov initially was given great, more, uh, more appellations, greater, greater praise, uh, he, he really shrinks in comparison with everything we know. Avram's a giant. And uh, Avram uh, was tested, right? He has 10. Um, what the actual number, what counts as one of these Sionis and what's not is one of the famous discussions in Chazal. Uh, if you want to see a nice summary of this, I, alert, I, I refer you to, of course, the Stone Chumash, which is which really has everything useful for the student, the serious student of Chumash. You'll go see they give they give um, several, not all, but several of the famous uh, enumerations of what the ten Nisyonos of Avram were. Uh, but we see it elsewhere. We see, for example, in the Book of Judges that the, the Canaanim, the Canaanites, when the Jews first come into Eretz Israel, are minasim as Bnei Israel. They test us. Uh, we do well sometimes, elsewhere we don't. It's interesting, the word Nisayon is mentioned in all of Tanakh. How many times would you say if you don't know? It's a pretty central, central theme, right? In a sense, it's really what defines us in life. Put in this world, we have freedom of choice, we're supposed to rise to it. Hashem sends his nisyonos, we pass, we don't pass, we die. It should be the central discussion. In all of Tanakh, the word nisayon appears six times. Not so many, but it's everywhere to be found. I mean, you virtually a, no narrative section of the Bible that doesn't somehow deal with it on some serious level. Uh, what is it exactly? Look, we all do it all the time. We're conscious. We're not conscious. If you don't know something, you test, right? I don't know where my students are holding. Okay, pop, pop quiz. Everybody take out your pencil and paper, right? You test somebody. Um, the great testers of the world are children constantly testing us in inconvenient <laughs> ways the parents wish they wouldn't, right? Anybody a, a, a counselor in summer camp? Right? So the first couple days, and it's usually this happening on the subconscious level, people aren't even aware that they're doing it. You know, if you're a good counselor, you'll sit down, you'll, you'll be friendly and warm, and you'll, you know, you'll, 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 you'll spell out the rules. And then in the minds of the campers, they're thinking, okay, those are the rules, yeah, but everybody knows that's what you're saying. Who knows if that's what you mean? And then for the next few couple days, they are going through the ritual of testing you constantly. And if you know this to begin with, and by the way, this is just a setup for parenting. Because you haven't seen anything, you know, if, if you're, all, you've, all you've done is, a, is, is be a camp counselor. Because this is the way it is in life. Your kids are constantly testing you. And whether or not you rise to the test, whether you pass the test, please or pretty please, you know, we just, I just had one of my, uh, uh, we were supposed to go out to lunch yesterday on a perfect day in Sheer. And um, we were, you know, it was nearing the one o'clock mark. You know what that looks like in Derech. And um, we'd taken a short break, and I said, you know, 1240, everybody's back. And one of the unfortunate saps came back at 1241, and no lunch yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, did he get glared at? Woo. Anyway, you know, it's a test. And I feel, uh, what am I doing here? You know, if I'm going to be a wimp on the test, then uh, what's, what's the structure for? And part of my reason of doing this is got to teach these hapless souls a little bit of discipline, right? A little, little uh, derech boot camp. But that's what tests are, you know, they're, they're, is this real? They're, yeah, really, this is what you're doing? 
And they're healthy and correct. That's the way we are in life. We test, and Hashem tests us, and we test each other. And uh, it's critical. It's an essential part of life. Now, Hashem knows everything. So then you get to, you get to an obvious question, of course, is that then he doesn't really need to test us in the least. Right? You ever consider this? Yeah, so it's possible the fact that the word is seldom mentioned in the entire Bible because it's rare that a challenging experience actually qualifies as a true Messiah. We'll make a distinction now. We'll get to this tomorrow too. But there are tests and there are tests. You know, there's the garden variety tests that we endure all day. Uh, and then there are things that we reach in life that are the true misionos. I, I can't speak for everybody's experience in this world. I'm sure they're variegated, but uh, I know for myself, I've, I've had, I have a uh, couple doozies. They're big tests. And you, you question, you know, am I equal to this? I, really? This is such a test. Uh, It could be also that when we have, you know, some people are not worthy of the tests. We know a major principle, a major assumption that Chazal make is that since Hashem is benevolent, He cares about us, He loves us, He's a, he's a Rahman, He's a compassionate God, so then He only sends tests to people who have the ability to pass them. I mean, He's not cruel. Yov went with that premise too. There can't be as I'm, I'm paraphrasing what we said before, it's not the nature of a benign director to create beings in order to harm them. And a test that's beyond us is masochistic. What is this? You know, some kind of circus where I'm definitely, you know, or a bullfight where, you know, the bull's going to maul me because I'm just not qualified. Right? So clearly it has to be within our reach. And sometimes it's not our reach. We have hard times. We have hard times and maybe we're on the lower level. And maybe there were, there's less hashkacha pratis, as we said earlier. Here's, I'll end with this, and it's food for thought for tomorrow. Anybody who came in a little late, um, we, we I, on Tuesday, I think, unless I change things tomorrow, but I'm pretty sure I'll be at um, either the Brickman and or the Greenwald wedding. Somehow we're orchestrating that during Corona days when the numbers of guests at weddings are severely restricted. And... Uh, exactly how it's going to work. I have no idea, but uh, they're two of my closest friends in the world. So I'm going to do my best to do something. Uh, anyway, so Tuesday night, I don't think we'll be on, but hopefully tomorrow and Wednesday we will. So we'll, uh, and we'll get the word out. Anybody else wants to join us. Anyway, uh, here's a medrash that tackles our issue of misionos, and it gives us a lot to think about. Uh, the medrash asserts that Hashem only tests Sadiqim, righteous, who have the stamina to suffer. It says it outright. And it outlines three different functions. What could and ideally should a test, a Nisayon, really bring? And it, it expresses it, as a Medrash often does, in um, sort of elusive terms, describing, and, and if you're taking notes, it's probably a good way to go if you want to consider and come up with a shot in this. It gives three tantalizing images. Image number one, and this is Medrash Rabbah, says, a seller takes out his pottery to sell, and he hits it as a test. What's that for? To demonstrate how tough it is. Good. Consider that. It's one image, one function of a test. Number two, and some of these are going to sound overlapping, but they each hit upon a, a different nuance. The second image the Medrash gives us, now it's not a pottery seller, it's a rug merchant. Okay, uh, so a rug merchant hits, and in this case, let's say the material's flax. There's a different aim now in testing it. What's the difference between the pottery merchant and the rug merchant? To see if it needs improvement. Okay, you're onto something. To clean it I'm just out. gonna say it a little differently. But I'm giving you right now food for thought. I'm not gonna spell out at least my version. I'm sure you have your own too. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, discuss the Medrash in depth. We'll pick up with this tomorrow. The third image to, to, to leave with and to consider overnight is the following. A donkey has to carry the greatest burden. 
donkey or the beasts of burden, the quintessential beasts of burden. That's a different kind of test altogether. So three very, very intriguing, pungent kinds of images, different dimensions of Nisayon that we should consider overnight. Any closing questions or thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, does, uh... The, there's the famous Malchok is Beisham this hill about, you know, to be born, not to be born, Bar Mitzvah boy. Um, how, does anyone should the know? world have been created? Should people have been created that part, that Malchok is? Right. So does yeah. anyone, so it seems like Eov is going along similar, although obviously not exactly the same point. Well, let's just remind everybody in case it's not fresh for people. The, um, the one option is, Beishamai's uh, preferred option is that, um, better that the world, better that people would not have been created. And Beis Hillel goes with the side that uh, better the world is created, that people are here. And the halacha, even though this is far from a halachic discussion, Paskins in this case, like Beis Shammai, which is kind of bleak. But then it concludes and says, but now that we're here, let's do something with it. I don't know, that's from re recreating it from my own memory. I don't know if you would, uh, if I, if, if you, yeah, if I missed any of the details, but that's the gist of it. And of course, there's a lot of lot of meat on those bones too. We can, we can pick apart. But go ahead. What do you want to do with it, Ethan? So um, it seems like Eov's really go going along the lines of Beishama here, although it seems like he's going on a different route as well. And like Beishama. yeah, he's but yeah, yeah, and he doesn't take the uh, optimistic upbeat. You know, okay, yeah, maybe there's no purpose, but now that we're here, let's do mitzvahs. Let's rack up the skliyos. Right, that's not, we don't hear that much in Eov's voice these days. Right. But even Beis Shammai didn't seem to really pass him like that, you know? Yeah. But, I don't know, just yeah, that. Great, 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 uh, great concept to bring into the discussion, too. Thanks, for, thanks for, uh, yeah, for bringing that in. Good. Okay, it's great seeing everybody, and uh, I'll stay on as always, and otherwise I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Rabbi. See you tomorrow. Okay, thank yeah. you, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Rabbi. By the tone. Or good afternoon, as the case may be. Anybody have anything uh, individual you want to talk about? I have a, I have a question. Oh wait. Oh, wait. oh, wait. No, no, you Great. can go. Trust me. Um, regarding Moshon Ara, let's say you're, let's say like you're, you're in a, like a, like a, you're playing basketball and you're constructing teams. And is it considered Moshon Ara, like if you say like, oh, I don't want that guy, like, like he has like a weakness in this area and that area. Great question. Um, so it's it's not just a question about the Hara, but it's a question about one of my favorite topics, which is in this week's Parsha. Right. So, you know, everything you're learning is always in whatever it is, this week's Parsha. So in Parsha Bahar, we learn a major principle of what's called Onus Dvarim, something I think came up in Neo a few days ago too, which is you're not allowed to say or do anything that would cause another person to feel bad. Well, that definitely counts. No, I'm not picked for the team. You know, I'm too flabby or whatever, whatever the reason is. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sulk and, and mope and read third chapter of Eov. Um, right. So, <laughs> the question is, the question is, is is that lashon hara? So we know that one of the of the three qualities, you know, it has to be something true. It has to be either damaging or derogatory. But it has to be something that has no purpose. And what you describe, you could say, reasonably serves a function. Meaning, I mean, you're picking teams. Everybody knows these are the rules of the game. Everybody's trying to get the most qualified players for their team. So all's fair in love and war, you know, like, uh, you know, this is the way it goes. And if you don't like the, pos the prospect of, you know, of rejection, so don't play. Right? Okay. So you could say that, therefore, there's Toelis and it's all forgiven. Uh, halacha that I like to quote a lot because I think it has, multi it, has, it has many levels of relevance is the Shuva in the Rush, who's writing in the 1300s about uh, two people who go into in for jousting, right? Sword, sword, uh, sword fighting, and one of them gets injured and wants to know if he can seek damages. <laughs> and the Rush points out, he said, "Look, <laughs> you, nobody asked you to start jousting. It's the rules of the game. You know, you get damaged under those circumstances. You were mochel marosh. You forgave uh, from the outset because you knew that this was at least a possibility." Yeah, so you could make the same argument here. However, and you knew this however was coming, there's so many ways of doing it. I think you can do both. I think you can often, not just do my basketball games, but in many cases, 
you can both pick the best men or most qualified men for your team and also really worry about people's feelings. There's a ways of going about doing it. I mean, I mean, people do it in a nasty way. People use kind of, you know, language that's not, not flattering. I mean, what about instead of just saying the negative, why don't you say, and say, why well, we don't want Plony, why don't you say, well, uh, well oh, Amoni would be great. He's a great team spirit. And just, you know, play up at his strengths as opposed to the other guy's weaknesses. I did that this morning because we, we have a minion, almost. No, we're, we're there. We have a minion in Yeshiva. It's so tricky because we don't want too many guys, but we want guys, right? So it's, kind of the, it's, it's Corona, Corona, Minyan in days. Anyway, so we got a minion, and um, I wanted to give them soft rebuke. So I said, uh, I, at the end of davening, it was just me and Rebbe Pitten were the only Rebbe's there. And I said, I just want to give a call out on behalf of Mrs. Pitham and Mrs. Blyweiss and um, uh, for, all, for the two or three of you who uh, took the trouble to put on masks today. I want to thank you on behalf of our wives and our children and our grandchildren, you know, at which point uh, people understood me, Hena Tashomei Alav, this was all safe from the positive, right. you, you infer the negative. So people could always come to their inference, but it's a nice way of letting them down. So like allude to it indirectly. If you, and it was the, the, you could still, it, again, it's, it, it takes a certain amount of savvy and sophistication to do this properly. But if you can somehow call the teams in a way that minimizes the damage, it keeps people's feelings in the front of your minds and you try not to do it in an insulting way, I think that's reasonable. Okay. I mean, a, a summary then, given that there's rules of the game, everybody knows that they may not be picked, fine. But while you're doing that, try to pick in a way that takes people's humanity into consideration. Yeah, the, the situation I had in mind is like, let's say two teammates are on the side privately discussing like who they want to pick up. And I want like, and like what, like are you- So make sure, that's, that's, make sure that conversation is done in utter secrecy. Nobody should get wind of how, what you spoke about. And then okay. if, as long as you do it with Toelis, and nobody's feelings can be hurt, and, you're, and you try to just say the words that are necessary, to say, yeah, he'd be an addition to the team. I'm not sure he would meld together with the rest of the people, and it's all practical. I don't think this will show Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rob, my, my uh, question also is about Shon Hara. Um, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's more of a simple question. Um, maybe even just yes or no, but can I can I listen? Can I hear Shon Hara? Like, nope. nope, not allowed. It's one of the reasons why the media is an issue. It's not a blank, I mean, for all kinds of reasons, but among them is Lashon Hara. They announce something on the news and you listen to it. Remember the Chavetz Chaim brings the Gemara and Gitin and Kedushin. It says it's not the um, mouse that steals, it's the hole. It's the hole that he scurries the, you know, the, the stolen cheese into. And the Chavetz Chaim says the meta idea is it's not, it's not only the speaker that gets the sin, it's the listener too. If there was no listener, uh, the speaker would have no, put, he's not doing an Avera. So if you're listening and you're receiving Lashon Hara, that's also an Avera. Not allowed to do it. So you got to be selective about what your source of news is. Mm -hmm. And then what if... What Today, if one of the popular blood sports is, is um, savaging the rabbis. We had a discussion here that was delicate. Somebody asked, and I invite random questions, but was asking about Rabbi Kniyevsky, Chaim's role in, and, and his decision-making in terms of um, responding, should they be quarantined or not at the beginning? Well, the news just the, the, the news people just love to savage the gedolim. The more you can show that they're inept, or uh, whatever other adjectives you want to apply to them, so then the happier they are, that it's all self-indicating. They would do that to so all the to that. Alive, right? What's that? They would do that all the time to Rabbi Vajra when he was alive, right? Yeah, they do it when he was alive, they do it when he's dead, which is a bigger affair too. Yes, you're not allowed to put yourself in that environment. So yeah, definitive yes answer. You have to be careful what you listen to. What if, People think, so, well, it's on the news, it's okay. It's, you know. but, wait, one, one what, if it's, what if it's not true? Because you said one of the guidelines is that it has to be true. Right, right, right. So then it's, it's, then it's not the Hara, then it's something worse called Motsi Shemra. Then it's slander. Then it's a whole other, other uh, bag of problems. I've actually heard a whole thing on how uh, Lashon Hara is actually worse than Mosei Shemra. Well, it's worse in a few ways. I mean, on a basic level, you know, at least if it's true, so it's, you know, you're, you're, you can defend it. Because at least you just convey something true. Uh, Mosei Shemra is you're making up falsehoods. That's, that's a calumny. 
but um, but you're right because if it's true, people are going to rationalize it a lot more. Say, well, it's okay because it's real. It's true. So they're going to be more more uh, more prone to, to saying it. Uh, one that I've heard a bit more, um, I don't know, esoteric that uh, when people make a bait din and even like an informal bait din, uh, you know. We use the term in English, a court of public opinion, and they cast judgment on someone. There's a corollary thing in Shemayim, which can cause more problems yeah. than... If I'm not mistaken, the, Me Too, the, the current Me Too movement and its corollaries that are all over the press are an extension of this. You know, somebody decides to call a press conference and, and proclaim that a person's, uh, you know, molested them or, or accosted them in any way. Um, the person may be totally innocent, but the damage is done. It's over. Once the person's associated with that kind of uh, behavior, then they're often ruined. The reputation shot. Yeah. 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 We're not supposed to be part of that. It's not, that's them? not just. I mean, it may be, listen, people who abuse, people who molest, people who do terrible things should be brought to justice, which is not that way. Does Rebbe have a file on like Me Too stuff or is it? Well, it, I, you know, it's funny. I don't have, haven't written it up, but I just gave it over. I've given over several years and I just did it. We just had it in the random question. We had a really heated, great uh, session on uh, last week, last, last maybe Wednesday or something, precisely on this and, and, and the delicacy of it because uh, it's really quite a discussion. I don't want to, I don't know if it, we're, we're winding things up here, but uh, it's huge because, uh, Again, it's an unjust forum, the public, the, the 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 court of public opinion, and yet sometimes in you know powerless and and sometimes people who are abused, um, the predators, you know, uh, they they work with silence as a way of manipulating and keeping you know this will just be our secret, <clears throat> and so sometimes they feel they have no recourse, and indeed sometimes people take, they report the abuse to authorities who then say that didn't happen. The, the authorities are often not authorities. They're, not, they're, they're in denial. They're not protecting the victims. So that comes with, uh, that, that, that's one side and, and, and a grievous side of, of the predicament that people find themselves in. And of course, a lot of the abuse is the powerful abusing the powerless. And Hashem always looks out for the underdog. But on the other hand, everybody today who has, you know, got a C on his science test and is still resentful of that science teacher because of him. I didn't get into my preferred college, so that they can they can call the press conference and said he you know he molested me. It's 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 it's, it's Hefkerfeld. It's a, it's the Wild West now with this with this. So um, so the the current situation is deplorable on every level, and has to be uh, the, the halachic approach is not. Uh, we have to we have to put things uh, put put things in the hands of the base team. Has to be adjudicated. There were mess ups. There was a, there a few incidents. I don't want to refer to them by name. They're probably well known anyway. Uh, there was a case, the notorious case of somebody involved with, in a youth group a couple decades ago who initially was given a pass by the base team. The base team publicly apologized for that and then brought him to some kind, some sense of justice, at least putting him under control because he continued his, his machinations afterwards. So the, the people who are predators and, and worse out there and they need to be dealt with. But um, consider when you when you do it, you submit it to the court of, court of public opinion. The, implica the implications of this: you destroy lives, you destroy their wife. They didn't do anything wrong, right? The kids might not get shidduch; they might not, might get it not into schools. If you know, if it's known that their father did X. Yeah. So these are very important, heavy discussions, and they need to be talked talked about in a halacha context. And I have a lot of stories, but I'm not going to digress too much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi, I suspect you and I might fall on a, might have some different opinions on this. Oh yeah, why? Uh, just on exactly how things are dealt with, how things have historically been dealt been dealt with, and what what are gonna be, what's gonna be the least harmful. What what historically have been the least harmful right, things? Right, right. Well, I mean. This is why, I, I, as a believer in Hashem and His Torah, so I believe that the only system that's ultimately just is the Torah system, and the and, and the Beistin and the Gedolim, who are able to factor in the greater good and to know how to weigh what's 
what we're saying here is that there are a lot of problems and sometimes either way you go, you're creating problems. Well, they're uniquely qualified to determine what to weigh and what to prioritize. And um, they also have a siyat deshmaya in doing so. The average lay person, the mortal person, regular secular court, they're just doing what makes sense, whether it makes sense or not. Lisa Bastian has some divine assist. Yeah, Good. again, I, 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 I don't think it's, we don't have time to go into this and I definitely don't have anything prepared, but. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Just say, I, I, I think we might uh, fall uh, different. Very possibly. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of very of urgency and relevance in the world today. Yeah, keeps coming up. I, in a lot of ways, am actually more cynical than you. Which uh... <laughs> okay, it's an interesting position but, to find myself okay. because you're often a racing. Cynical. Everybody, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow, Rabbi. Rabbi, Rabbi if it's over. Yeah, good afternoon, Rabbi. Bye bye, of... Rabbi. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So I had uh, kind of led on to something before.